Sharon Portnoff is the Ellie Wazell Associate Professor of Judaic Studies and Associate Professor and Chair of the Classics, Arabic, and Jewish Studies Department at Connecticut College. She holds degrees from St. John's College in Annapolis, Harvard University, and the Jewish Theological Seminary. She is a published author with many books and articles to her credit. Sharon has participated in two fellowships sponsored by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and served as a scholar in residence at the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism and Policy at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sharon Portnoff. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. I'm really uh, happy to be here. I know that you were uh, lured, lured here with a promise uh, that I would discuss Primar Levy's life. Um, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do today, and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, what I wanted to do was to talk about what Primar Levy is most known for in his Holocaust witnessing, and that is its deep literary quality. And I wanted to talk about why he does that. Um, I don't, I'm hoping that people got the readings. Did, were, were they, did people receive readings? Okay, so that's that's going to affect the presentation, which I had um, I had thought to make it much less formal. I didn't write a formal uh, lecture out. Um, I did have some comments that I'd like to make. Uh, initially, I'll give you a brief outline of, of his life, and I guess what I'll do to try to um, to try to make it so people don't get lost in my talking about something that you had no uh, previous you know information for. Um, just interrupt me. So we'll make it informal. If you have a question, uh, you know, put it in the chat. And I don't know who was monitoring that, Al or Joel or Stan, but, um, and I can be interrupted and we can sort of have a conversation. Um, so I, um, I don't know, I'm going to start at the beginning for, in case for people who maybe don't, aren't aware of him. Uh, he is a great Italian writer of the 20th century. And that's generally speaking, um, and also one of our finest, and I would say our finest Holocaust memoirist. Um, so he was an, a secular Italian Jew, uh, but keep in mind, right, secular in Europe isn't quite what secular is in the US. Uh, so he had a strong Jewish identity and he, he, he knew what it was to be Jewish and separated in that sense, but they were not particularly a practicing family. He was born in 1919 in Turin. Um, and he received a traditional Jewish, a traditional Italian education, forgive me, um, that included all the canons, like that old European uh, education where you got everything you needed. Um, and that, and it's going to come up why this comes up, uh, that included Dante's Commedia, the comedy. Um, and that became a very important source for him while he was in Auschwitz uh, to have that poem, that poem with him. Uh, nevertheless, he prepared for a career in chemistry uh, before his capture. So those were sort of the two things that enabled him to survive when he was in Auschwitz. The fact that he had Dante sort of with him uh, and also uh, the fact that he could practice, he was a, an able chemist. I mean, he was brilliant. He was always first in every class he took. Um, and he was able to be indoors during his time in Auschwitz because he worked in a chemical lab. So he wasn't exposed to the elements. Um, he was captured in December 1943 by the Italian fascists. He was working as uh, an Italian uh, partisan. He was fighting. Um, and the Italian partisans, I don't know if it's utterly unique or just uh, sort of unique, uh, but relatively uh, unique. Uh, the partisans were, were both Jews and non-Jews working together. So in Poland, they were really segregated. You had partisans of non-Jews and partisans, Jewish partisans, non-Jewish, and they didn't really work together in a mixed group. But in Italy, they did. Uh, so when he was captured, uh, by, uh, the Italian fascists interrogated him and uh, he revealed that he was a Jew. Uh, and so they uh, turned him over to the Nazis. He was sent to the transit camp at Fossili uh, and then ultimately to the death camp Auschwitz. Uh, he got there in, at the end, I think the end of January, the beginning of February, 1944. Uh, and he spent 11 months there uh, until he was liberated by the Russians in January of 1945. Uh, 
it took him a year to get back to Turin, as I'm sure many people know. The trains, the train tracks were all bombed out or whatnot. Um, and the two memoirs that he writes, his two Holocaust memoirs, really deal with those two things. The first one is about Auschwitz, and that's what I am going to talk about today, at least a little bit. I hope um, what it was, what it was to be in that camp, witnessing uh, to what was happening. Uh, and the second one really is about that journey home, that year's journey home. Uh, both of them, by the way, and I'll get to this, are really in conversation with Dante's comedy. Uh, for those who aren't that familiar with it, the comedy is divided into three sections, three canticles. Uh, the first one is Hell, Inferno, and that is Auschwitz. The second one is um, Purgatory, and that is uh, the second memoir is called The Truce. That is the journey home sort of trying to journey back to something real. Um, the third one's called Paradise, and I think for relatively obvious reasons, uh, Levy does not have a third memoir about, about Auschwitz. Um, after he survived Auschwitz, he became a celebrated writer. And I, I think it's said in the program notes, the memoirs, he wrote novels, he wrote short stories, he wrote essays, uh, he wrote letters, he wrote poems. Uh, he also was a con constant contributor to La Stampa, the newspaper. So Levy, what drove him more than anything else was, the, was communicating. He wanted to write simply and accessibly so that everybody could understand what he was saying. And so he writes sort of in levels. So if you read anything of his, right, if you don't know what a great writer he is or, 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 or tired or something, when you read him, You'll just read it and think, oh, what an interesting, thoughtful piece. If you do know that there's much more there to look at, you will be driven to an entire library of literary figures uh, from Eliot to Manzoni and Dante's my, my Thing, and that was his main driver, Dostoevsky, even in little newspaper articles. He's alluding to these different, he's having a conversation with the entire Western tradition. Uh, my argument is um, that the reason he's having this argument is he's trying to both restore what it is to be human uh, and also and also uh, to to warn people about the possibility of becoming non-human. That is of being kicked out of the nobler aspect of the human being that enables us to write literature. So um, back to his. Right, so the first one, uh, it's called Survival in Auschwitz in English, which is a shame uh, because its real title is If This is a Man, Sequestro in Uomo. In 1947, it was published. Um, it didn't get much traction at the time, uh, but um, apparently a, a number of young people had read it. Uh, and when they read it, suddenly they started inviting him to speak and this was what was so important to him, this reenactment of human connection. He gave hundreds upon hundreds of lectures uh, and talks to groups. No group was too small to him. He would come to the library and talk to five people. He would go to an auditorium and talk to a thousand people. He did this for many, 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 many years. Um, so if this is a man, notice in the title, Right, he's asking, is this is a, if is this a man? What is the human being? Do we have the power to destroy what it is to be human? Right? He's not giving an answer, survivor in Auschwitz, he survives, so somehow it's all over, or somehow human beings could just sort of forget it. Right? You we both have to remember it and also move beyond it, right? Somehow at the same time. And that that's sort of the, the, the knot he's trying to untie. Um the second of I mentioned is The Truce. That was written a few years later in 1963. I know that in your, uh, your thing, the periodic table uh, was mentioned in the little blurb. Uh, that was published in 1975, but he really had started writing it uh, as soon as he got home. One of the earliest stories in it is called uh, Chrome. Right? So he takes an element in, of, the, of the periodic table, and I'm sorry, but when it comes to chemistry, I'm as dumb as the doornail, so I don't know anything about anything. but. Um, but what he does is he takes each element and writes about its chemical properties in a way that humanizes it without losing 
the 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 you know the yichus of it, the the you know the the actual thing of it, the, the fact of it. Um, they're magnificent stories, and Chrome is my favorite one because that he he writes about meeting his wife. He gets back, and the way that they court uh, is by walking the streets together. They just walk and they walk and they walk and they talk and they talk. It's very very beautiful. Um, so. Uh, uh, he did have a third Holocaust memoir, and this just goes to show how um, how literary, how careful he is with his with his words. Uh, called Moments of Reprieve, which was published in 1978, and those are, those are stories that he remembered from his experience in Auschwitz that didn't make it into the book. So the book is highly structured, highly literary. Um, it's a mixture, really, of witnessing and and novel. Um, right, I mean, the, right, Truman Capote does this, right? So it was, it was something that was on the literary scene at the time, but it was something that lent itself specifically to the Holocaust. Um, so interestingly enough, how he cared so much about being in the world, even as he cared about the ability to ascend the world to our nobler selves, uh, all through his life, he also worked every day, all day as the manager of a chemical plant. Right, so that's what he did during the day, and then he'd go home and write these magnificent poems and novels uh, until about 1974, and that that's when he did retire uh, to write uh, permanently. Um, he died in 1987. Uh, it's an apparent suicide. Um, there's a controversy about whether it was a suicide. To my mind, it was obviously a suicide. Um, uh, Cynthia Ozick actually refers to the last thing he wrote uh, called The Drowned and the Saved, which was a collection of essays um, that was published in 1986, the year before he died, um, that uh, she, she refers to that as his suicide note, right? And uh, he says somewhere, and he says in that, the, drown the uh, gray zone is the most famous essay from that, that book. And he says in the gray zone that that human beings just can't get past thinking in binaries, right? So it seems to me that the, that what the essence of what he wanted to communicate, that isn't binary, right? That isn't just about information. That isn't just about trauma. That somehow is, is the ascension from trauma without letting go of the trauma. Um, he just couldn't seem to get past it. Uh, his grand, that said, I mean, his grandfather had killed himself in a way similar to the way he killed himself. Uh, so, right, so I'm not making any kinds of grand claims about, you know, some, some literary tragedy of, of his suicide. Uh, but whatever it was, it, it seems likely that that's, uh, that that's what it was. Uh, so now I wanted to sort of move on to the literary stuff that I, I really wanted to talk about, if, if everybody's okay with that. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, as I said, uh, the memoirs are noted for their literary quality. And that may seem like, like, you know, an invitation, right? Obviously, it's exceedingly painful. He needed to make sure people were willing to read it, right? So Anna Langfuss, for those who had know some Holocaust literature, uh, her first place, she couldn't get anybody to, to read it. They all walked out. It was performed once and everybody walked out because it was too real, it was too painful. Right, so, so that may be an obvious thing, uh, but, but he, he knows he's running the risk of not being believed, right? So we have all these faux memoirs, right? Of people claiming they were there, right? All these faux Holocaust memoirs. And remember about five years ago was that big controversy about whether it's all right to write fiction about the Holocaust, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it is a bit of a risk for him to do it, but um, I think the reason he does it is because it, it really gets to the kind of witnessing that he wants to do. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay this out a little bit more, but um, there are two pieces to it. I've said it before, but I'll repeat it again. So one is that he is witnessing to something that cannot be witnessed to, right? He calls it the demolition of a man. It can't be witnessed to because the, per, the man to, who is demolished cannot witness to it. Right? That's the definition of the, of the demolished, right? In other words, we cannot imagine what it is to not be able to imagine, right? Right, that it's, it's an impossibility. 
right? So literature is one of the means by which she's able to sort of allow us to imagine what really happened without getting too close to it, right? Without, like, from the outside, I guess is sort of how I put it. Uh, and the second thing is, right, it's not just about witnessing to it, it's also about issuing a warning about it, right? And that is by having these reenactments of the possibility uh, of humanity being brought to life through our efforts. We can't think it back to life, but we can through interaction, through imagining, through sensitive reading, through remembering Dante, through remembering Eliot, all the other writers that I love, we can somehow reenact humanity, both in the sense of my being here with you and having a conversation and caring about each other, and also in the sense of how the Western canon has defined what it is to be human. So that I think is, is sort of what he's, what he's getting at. Um, so the problem, the problems of witnessing like to Auschwitz in general, in more general terms, um, and it was a Nazi goal. The Nazis intentionally did this and that was to leave no witnesses. Um, so there's the obvious sense, right? The obvious sense of not leaving witnesses. Um, uh, and those people who, who were the quintessence of what the Holocaust was, of what Auschwitz was, who were the very heart of the Nazi strategy, those are the ones who, who are not here, and did not survive, right? Those are the ones who ended in the gas chambers, right? And nobody was in there. So the very heart of what needs to be witnessed to cannot be witnessed to. Right, nobody was there. So that's one thing. Um, we cannot really know what Auschwitz was because we cannot know the heart of it. Uh, more deeply, uh, this problem of leaving no witnesses uh, is that those who would survive, and we've heard about survivor guilt and, and whatnot, those who did survive still can't witness to what they did, because they, they, the Nazis ensured that they were not there while it happened, right? So this was what the demolition of a man was. That is to say, they had no will, they had no thoughts. At, Levy talks about it through it, that they were only stomachs. They weren't anything, they were stomachs. And Wiesel actually uses the same expression. If you once you start reading a lot of these Holocaust memoirs, you find that they all sort of say the same sorts of things. They were re all the all the stuff that makes us human, the aspirational stuff, the ability to imagine, to transcend our actual existence was demolished. Right. So so there was no way to to witness to what even you yourself had actually done. Um, so another way he talks about this, one of the, um, one of the overarching uh, images of uh, survival in Auschwitz, or if this is a man, uh, he characterizes the uh, Auschwitz itself as a giant biological experiment. And he picks this up uh, in the gray zone, that essay I mentioned from the drowned in the sea. Um, and that is, that it was, it was a, a living representation of the Nazi dream of grandeur. And it differed from other tyrannies. What made it such an experiment for him, and remember this is a scientist talking, right? He's very careful with language, um, is that there was, no, there was no means to rebel from the bottom, right? So other tyrannies, when you have these self-contained totalitarian societies, there's room for rebellion at the bottom or there's room for something from the outside, right, to sort of aid in some kind of rebellion. In Auschwitz, there wasn't. It was a completely self-contained system where the people at the bottom were, and Levy calls them puppets. Uh, and he's not the only one. A number of writers called them puppets. But that's because the Nazis called the Jews puppets. He's recording it, actually. Or, or pieces, puppets or pieces. They, they weren't really there. Uh, so one of the overarching uh, motifs of the memoir uh, is that they are living within the Nazi 
dream of grandeur, right? So the Nazis had this dream about this hierarchy, Nazis at the top, you know, Slavs in the middle and Jews at the bottom, you know, however they, they did their silliness, um, um, that they were living inside of it. And he's very careful with this use of the word dream. So throughout the book, Levy will describe the dreams that the prisoners have and they're common dreams, right? So when they're asleep, everybody dreams the same thing. So their, their jaws chew, um, they, 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 and they dream of coming home. Everybody has the same dream. So even asleep, they're within the Nazi dream of grandeur. And when they're awake, right, there's no connection to the experience of what it is. So they have no sleeping, they have no waking. They're living literally inside somebody else's dream that makes them not real. Um, I saw that somebody had a, a, a question. I can, I, can, I can stop for a minute if you want. Did, should I or? I don't see anything in the chat and uh, I don't know if I- Oh, I saw a chat. The... Oh, oh, okay. Okay, I thought I saw, I thought I saw chat. Okay. All right, so at this point, I was going to sort of read. You did. Oh. I sent oh. it. I sent oh. it to the wrong person. Oh. Okay. <laughs> are, you, are you like passing notes in class? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Okay, so at this point, I was going to read uh, something from the, I, I get, I mean, can I just read to people? Would that be? Would that be something you can, I mean, I mean, I, all right. I see somebody nodding, so I'll, I'll, yes, I'll try. Yes, yes. All right. I was hoping you'd have the text in front of you. I'm, I'm sorry that you don't. Uh, okay. So this comes at, right, the, I gave you, what I had sent you was the first chapter and a half. So chapter one, the first half of chapter two and chapter 11. So this comes from the, the middle of chapter two. Right, the, the end of what I sent you. It's a, it's a paragraph worthy of, of hearing though. Now notice the first word because it's the first word that matters so much. Imagine, imagine now a man who was deprived of everyone he loves and at the same time of his house, his habits, his clothes, in short of everything he possesses. He will be a hollow man reduced to suffering and needs, forgetful of dignity and restraint. For he who loses all often easily loses himself. That hollow man, by the way, for those of you who are like Eliot, right? T.S. Eliot. He will be a man whose life or death can be lightly decided with no sense of human affinity. In the most fortunate of cases, on the habit of a pure judgment of utility. It is in this way that one can understand the double sense of the term extermination camp, right? The double sense of the term extermination camp. And it is now clear what we seek to express with the phrase to lie on the bottom, right? So in other words, He's asking us to imagine it, right? He's using this as using literature as a means by which to inspire us to imagine. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna look up Eliot. I'm gonna see what that's like, right? Which was purely imaginative, it wasn't real, right? It was, I mean, it, was, it wasn't actual, let's say it was real, but it wasn't actual, let's say, right? Um, Right and right, it cannot be said because you cannot imagine what it is to be able to imagine. So he's asking us to imagine what it might mean, the double sense of extermination. Right? That is, and my, my teacher and, and, and dear friend, uh, Emil Fackenheim put it this way, the Nazis destroyed human souls before they destroyed human bodies, right? So the double, right? So is that so? I was hoping that that section would make clear to people what it is that, why he uses literature, because there's absolutely no way to speak, right, about what actually happened in a way that communicates it 
without invoking our imagination, without content. Is that sort of, is that, is that clear enough? Yeah, I see some people nodding, so I appreciate that. Okay, so, um, so even though Levy can witness only to his own experience and not to the event as a whole, and, and that is what's needed. Somehow we need to talk about Auschwitz or we need to talk about the Holocaust, but he's one person. Right? He, and he survived. He's not representative of anything. I mean, to claim that he's representative only, almost uh, progresses the Nazi agenda, right? That you can clump people all together, that they're not individuals. Um, so, but literature is the means by which he, like all great poets and writer, writers, communicates something uh, which is universal, which arises from his personal experience. Right, so he can take what he did experience and ask us to imagine and, and make it universal as a, as, a, as a work of literature. Right, so it provides the means for Levy to not witness to at least point to what actually happened and at best have us participate in what actually act happened. Right, to communicate to us viscerally, not in words, because there are no words, right, but viscerally somehow we know it without being lost in despair about it, right? That somehow we get a clinical, a clinical, a scientific view, a rational view of what it is from outside. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to like um, talk about uh, uh, about why he uses Dante in particular. Um, uh, if that's all right, if you're not being overloaded, I mean, are, do people, does any, has anybody ever read Dante? Does anybody like have some familiarity with Dante? Oh, you know, a few people. All right, so I'll, I'll go quickly, but, but then I'll shut up and, and let you guys, if you have anything you want to ask or talk about, we can talk about whatever you want. Because I love Levy and I talk about him forever. Um, so why Inferno, right? So you have the obvious reason, right? Auschwitz is hell. Um, but from what we've seen already, it's not just that Auschwitz is figuratively hell. Auschwitz is literally hell. Remember this double sense that we're getting at, right? It's not just the imagination that's destroyed. It's also the actuality, right? It's, it's that both things, both things are destroyed. Leslie Epstein, if you've ever read King of the Jews, um, right? So Leslie Epstein, Epstein, calls it the, the destruction of the imagination, right? That, that that's what the Nazis really destroyed was the imagination itself. Um, so both figuratively and as we can see literally, we'll see that in a minute more clearly, I guess. Um, and also because Dante's poem, it was so instrumental in what we in the West mean by the human, how we define what the human is or what humanity is. Um, Right, so the comedy, uh, obviously the two great works of Italian literature, ask anybody, is Manzoni's The Betrothed and Dante's Comedy. Uh, those are always the dual poles of, of, uh, of, uh, Itali of the Italian canon. And it was taught in the schools, the, ca the comedy that is, since the 15th century, right? So when it first wrote, he was a heretic, he was awful, it was on my index, but then they decided everybody liked it, so they'd They'd allow it, and it be, he became canonized, and, and the poem became uh, sacred. Um, uh, and but what's interesting is that Mussolini continued to use it. Or it, it became it was still taught in the schools uh, during the fascist uh, reign of of Mussolini. So somehow, humanity somehow either persisted or was destroyed in that process, that somehow Dante could be used in both contexts, says something uh, to Levy. Um, so, um, uh, so both things, it puts Auschwitz in the, the possibilities of human experience by writing this book, this memoir that's so deeply elusive to Dante, it becomes part of the canon, right? It becomes a, a, a a response to Dante, some right. Vir, Dante responds to Virgil. Levy responds to Dante, right? So it becomes part of the canon, but it also questions what was lost in this very reclaiming. You know, what are we reclaiming humanity from, right? 
what a, right? There's some kind of warning in there that Dante somehow got something profoundly wrong if Mussolini could use him, right? So, so it's sort of both things at the same time. Um, and, then, and now uh, you didn't really get, um, I guess, I mean, gee, there was so much I wanted to do, but I, I guess I'll just sort of say sort of generally, and then, then I'll be quiet. And if you want me to talk more about Dante and show you text about Dante, I will. Um, so the reason I gave you the chapters I gave you is so that you could see how he is literally implanting this memoir into the conversation with Dante. Um, it becomes a gloss on Dante in a number of ways. So you have in chapters one and two, this general parallelism, uh, let alone numerous allusions, which I can tell you about in the beginning. Uh, so what happens in one and two, Levy's entry into the camp is a dramatization of Dante's entry into hell. Right, so you have the first chapter is called The Journey. The second chapter is called On the Bottom. So the most famous journey in, in Italian thought is Dante's journey, but there's no journey. It's only the first chapter. Chapter two, he's right on the bottom. Um, just as Dante reveals in the first two cantos of Inferno his need for the journey, his fear of undertaking the journey, this transformation into a pilgrim ready to undertake the journey, so too Levy reveals in the first two chapters of his memoir the reason for his deportation, his fear and confusion at the entry of the camp, his transformation into a prisoner, and this is what he calls on the other side of humanity. And for those who have uh, Jewish training, right, the Sitra Ahra, right, that's, that's really what he's also talking about, right? Right? Oh, I see somebody nodding, so I'll say another word about that. That is this realm of demons and ghosts that are that that in Prague, like think of those old cemeteries, right? Where where the Jews in, in a certain time and place believed literally that they were surrounded by these ghosts who at any minute, you know, were gonna come attack them, uh, right? Attack them at any minute. I well, I remember my great I mean, if you my mom's here, so I feel so weird saying it, but I remember my grandfather, my dad's mom, mom, my used to always go whenever I walk into the room, he used to say, hello, ugly. And I really like didn't like him very much as a result of that. He always called me ugly until I was much older. And I learned it was to keep the spirits away, because if he told them and true that he thought I was beautiful, well, then they'd come and they'd mar me in some way. I'd be in an accident. Right. So that's what he's talking about also. Right. With this on the other side of humanity. Um, um, so chapters one and two, uh, it becomes very specific right at the, at the turn between the two chapters, where he literally gets into hell in the same way that Dante gets into hell. That is, and he says it literally, Karen is his farrier into hell. Um, uh, chapter 11 uh, is called specifically the Canto of Ulysses. That is Inferno 26 of the comedy, which is the climax of, of Levy's memoir, and it is also the climax of Dante's comedy, not just the Inferno, the entire comedy. Uh, Ulysses is his uh, alter ego. Uh, um, he, is, he has this privileged space in it. He represents what, um, he represents what would have happened to Dante if having woken up in the dark woods, he had not chosen to go on the journey and save his soul. Levy's in the, Ulysses is in the bottom of hell, right? Um, he's the longest speech of anyone in, in the Inferno, in the, in the whole comedy, actually. Um, his speech ends the canto, unlike in any other canto. And also, he's the only character to be asked about his death, not about his sin, right? So Levy, for obvious reasons, is feeling a direct connection to this character. Um, and I'll just say one more thing. I mean, I have so much more to say, but I'll say one more thing unless you ask. Uh, and that is that this is the only canto, the only canto, the, see how much I love Levy to me. It's the only chapter in the memoir. There's 17 chapters. Chapter 17 is by far the longest. And it's really about his coming back to life. So dates return and names return, but there are no names 
uh, after the first chapter until chapter 11. And it is the only place in the memoir where Levy's name is mentioned, Primo. The reason this is so important is because the means by which Dante in Inferno 26 lets us know that Ulysses is him if he had done it wrong is by, by referring to Il Primo Canto, the first canto, right? Telling the reader, go back to the first canto, right? Il Primo Canto, so you heard me, right? So when Levy's name is used here, this is actually a way of pointing to his understanding that Levy is in fact Ulysses. He's not the Pilgrim Dante, he's Ulysses. He's stuck in somebody else's definition of the human and who needs to be condemned for the human to survive. Okay, then I'll shut up unless you want me to keep going then. Uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon, if you would like, I will uh, take us into the uh, sure. q and I'm just gonna change on my side to the gallery view so I can see everyone. Uh, thank you, by the way, for that wonderful presentation. I have a question in chat from someone I think you know named Lois, I believe is her name. Ah. I think uh, I've heard of her. I think you've heard of her. And <laughs> do, you, do you think his feeling of personalness, uh, personlessness led to his feelings of the futility of life and the only escape was death, which in a sense gives the Nazis a sort of victory? Can you read it again? I, I wish sure. I could see it. I'm much better with my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. Do you think that his feeling of personlessness led to his feelings of the futility of life and the only escape was death, which in a sense gives the Nazis a sort of a victory. That, that is absolutely correct for the Muslim or for most of the people in the camp. Levy was privileged, right? So he didn't, he, this is why he stayed outside, right? What he was, had to witness, he couldn't be inside it, but he was able to say at least to a certain extent outside for three reasons. One is, as I mentioned before, he was a chemist. So he was inside during the worst of it. Two is he had a best friend and they had a sort of underground and just having one friend meant that you, you couldn't be completely demolished. You had a friend. And the third thing was a practical thing. His name was Lorenzo. It wasn't really his name. Uh, he was a, P a POW, an Italian POW who met Levy during one of the work details and gave him food. And, and Levy says in the book, um, that it wasn't the food so much that enabled him to survive from Lorenzo. It was the fact that somebody looked at him and saw that there was a man there, that he was a man. So, and Lorenzo, what a, what a person he was. He would not allow uh, Levy to reveal who he was, uh, even though everybody knew him from the hometown uh, until, after, until after when Lorenzo died, uh, Levy did reveal it. The name escapes me at the moment, but... Uh, but, but, but so, so, I mean, I, I think the question sort of gets at the heart of w how the Nazis could be so successful and why Auschwitz was so self-contained because there, you were already dead before you were dead, right? There was no, you know, but, but, it, but it also gets that at why Levy was able to witness to it from the outside. And if we have time, I'll show you a couple more sections in the text where he really makes clear this outsideness. And one of our attendees is asking if the uh, chapters you've uh, referenced could be sent so that uh, people could look at them later on. Yeah, I, I sent them to you about two, three weeks ago. Oh, wow. I'm sorry if I missed that. All right. Uh, then in that case, then I must apologize and I'll make sure they get forwarded on. Um, let's see. Now I have a question here dovetailing with, and then I'll get to the, to the uh, I'll, I'll get back to you, Ronnie. Dovetailing with uh, Levy, having a friend is Victor Frankl's thesis that having a purpose, someone to either take care of or commune with was fundamental to survival. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that's exactly right. I think that's exactly right. You know, man's search for meaning that it's, that it's, ask not, what is that famous thing? Ask not what life, what, what we, don't ask what we ask of life, life, ask what life asks of us. Mm. I mean, I, I actually teach that uh, a lot in my Holocaust course, always with trepidation because I, I, I find myself so enraged by the end of it because while I think it's good life advice, um, he seems to gloss over the fact of his own privilege, 
Uh, and it, it seems to, I don't know, I don't mean to, but it, it seems to me that there, he's, uh, he's, uh, he trivializes the experience and the success that the Nazis had for those people who didn't have a warm fire by which to you know, make potatoes, et cetera, et cetera. So, and there's also some controversy about whether he was actually there and all that, but I, I won't speak to that. But yes, I think generally it's good advice, but maybe it's much deeper. All right, Ronnie, I think you had your hand up. Uh, thank you. Um, you talk about this in relationship to Auschwitz, of course. That was his experience, but um, I, I can't help but think that was it, every single death camp yeah. was that. I mean, yes. I don't think his experience was it's a terrible thing to say that it wasn't unique, uh, but I really don't think it was unique. Yes. Uh, I think that was everyone's experience. I did a little bit of reading to prepare for this and I just lost it. Um, there's a quotation that, uh, here it is. I am not even alive enough to know how to kill myself. Um, I'm just pondering that because they took his humanity away from him. So is that what he's talking about? Is he saying, I, I'm not human enough to even kill myself? Uh, does that mean that he finally felt human when he did? <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, because, you know, you're saying he, you're contending that it's likely that he did take his life. Uh, this, should we be happy for him? <laughs> I don't reject that. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I, 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 think, I think he was thrust into a situation where he was, I mean, obviously, I won't finish that sentence, but also so brilliant and so sensitive that he understood how complicated and difficult it was, right? So his, so for instance, you brought up the uniqueness. I agree with you, but if he, if he didn't claim his uniqueness, in his experience, then that's just giving a, something to the Nazis, right? So, so, you know, I, 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 I the Nazis had de, had derived. I think, I think, I, look, I don't, I don't want to speak for survivors. I, I, I know that, like, if we read Leon Wells, right? Maybe you've read him. He's one of the very few members of the Sonder Commandos who who survived. He, te he testified uh, uh, both at Nuremberg and uh, and at the uh, the Eichmann trials. He, um, he writes about sort of like what, the, what I call the paradox of hope. They, they were put in such a, into such a situation that if they hoped, they were, going to be, they were going to be killed. And if they didn't hope, they were already dead. There was absolute right, because if you hope, all right, so I'm hoping, so I'm gonna try to escape, one, they're gonna kill me, or I'm gonna hope that, that somebody comes to save me and nobody's going, nobody's coming. Right, so, so I, I can't really, I mean, your, your, your question's profound, but I think, I think that's what that if is all about, that it's up to us to make sure that we, we reenact humanity in our lives. Are there any Thank other you. questions? Just put your hands up and I'll call on you. Uh, there are a number of screens that do not have uh, images. So if I, if you've got your hand up and I'm not calling on you, just unmute yourself and, and, answer, and ask a question. But I don't see any hands up. Actually, I would appreciate it if she would continue. Is somebody there with a question? Malcolm? Uh, yes, I, I think we would love uh, Dr. Portnoff to continue. Huh? Okay. Okay, I think what I'll do, um, since not everybody knows Dante, you know, so that would be fun for me because Dante's my love. Um, I, I'll show you a little something about chapter one, right? The journey, right? Which turns out to be only so far as Auschwitz. The journey stops once he gets to the gates of Auschwitz and then he's on the bottom in two. I said that already. So the chapter starts with dates, very matter of fact, the recounting of the events, uh, sometimes asking us to think about it, and that gets more and more frequent as the chapter goes on until he just says, what would you do, right? I mean, he really just, we have to participate in understanding this outside of the words. Um, and then in this very center of the chapter, I'm going to read this to you because this becomes, 
the, the, the demarcation point. It's, this, it's just before the center of the chapter. Just to also show you how literary this is. So, um, right, so he's describing, they, they're, they're, they're now get, getting into the, the, the cattle cars, right, on the way to Auschwitz, right? They're being, they're being shoved in. And this is how he describes it. Exactly like this, detail for detail, goods wagons closed from the outside with men, women, and children pressed together without pity, like cheap merchandise for a journey towards nothingness, a journey down there towards the bottom. This time it is us who are inside, right? So notice what he's doing here, right? He starts literally outside. And then what does he do? He changes the point of view. Once he gets inside, right? For those people who have some, right? He switches to the omniscient point of view, right? This is what happened to me. We were inside. This time it is us who are outside, right? So suddenly, right, he's, we, we are, we, there's a distance between us and him, right? He's communicating to us that something is going on in that train that we can't have. And then he goes on in the chapter where you have this description uh, in the train, uh, the thirst, the hunger, the fear, the exhaustion till they get to the other side. I mentioned that already. Um, then you have here, right towards the very end of it. Remember we read this imagine, right? Without a name, without possessions, without anything. Listen to this, how he describes, uh, how he describes what happens uh, in the train and when they get there. This is the reason why three-year-old Amelia died. The historical necessity of killing the children of Jews was self-demonstrative to the Germans. Amelia, daughter of Aldo Levy of Milan, was a curious, ambitious, cheerful, intelligent child. Her parents had succeeded in washing her during the journey in the parked car in a tub with tepid water, which the degenerate German engineer had draw engines dragging us all to death. Right, so two things to notice about this. One is the Aldo Levy of Milan, right? No mention whether it's a relative or not. It isn't. I mean, I happen to know from other sources, right? So already his name has been stripped from him. And notice that what, what her sin is, the child's sin, is the German sin, right? Did you catch the, the, the literal meaning of it, right? So the, from the engine, those old steam engines, they would drip water, the filthy water from, you know, as it's moving along. And the parents trying to continue to be parents at wash the child in this water, coat her with, the with this water, right? So another way to put this is, right, that the Jews do it to themselves, right? In other words, they become the sin of the Nazis, right? It's actually painted on top of them. Uh, and then I had mentioned, right, that, that you have at the end of that chapter, uh, right, the Karen, who actually, who actually takes them, C-H-A-R-O-N, the same character uh, that takes them into hell. And then in the second chapter, right, you have it, the first thing is Arbeit macht frei, right? That is to say the sign over the gate, work makes free. That's precisely what met Dante, right? When he gets to hell, right? The, the abandoned hope you, you enter here, right? If, you, if people have read it, um, Right, and then in case we didn't get it, in case this is too literary for us, uh, just two paragraphs down, he has the sentence, this is hell, questo e l'inferno. Right, so we're literally living inside Dante's, Dante's, uh, Dante's book. And so when we get to, when we get to the canto, of, I, I wish we had more time, but when we get to the, the canto of Ulysses, right, so chapter 11, uh, the structure of it is very much the possibility of Levy saving himself. And sometimes I'll just say ill-informed people teach it. Isn't it wonderful? Dante was, you know, Dante helped Levy while he's, in, and that is nonsense. Dante is a dramatic device. Ulysses is a, a drama, dramatic device that uh, Levy uses to really paint 
uh, what it is to, to be forced to have something painted onto you, to have somebody else's sins painted onto you, even as you act in your best interest, the parents wanting to wash the child. Um, so the structure is, uh, Levy and his are, are working in some kind of underwater pipe and he's called up, right? He's called up, right, to see the sun, to go and get a, a, uh, the vat of soup for the day, which was like a hundred pounds. Uh, it would be a mile or two away that somebody would have to pick it up and two men would be allowed to go to, 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 to carry it with poles over their shoulders. The soup. So it begins with him coming out of the shaft. It continues with this long walk during which he and the piccolo uh, speak. They talk and they talk about Dante. That to him is the most important thing to talk about. Um, then he cites Dante uh, as if to connect to something permanent about the human journey. Uh, and it ends with a resubmersion into the soup, right? So, and getting back to Ronnie's question, right? About this, this paradox of hope, this, this sort of like, Right, soup is both the means by which they can survive, and it's also the water by which they all die, by which they're all submerged. Right, so uh, you know they all have distended bellies. Right, I mean I don't have to go into details. I presume people have knowledge of how water would kill them. They didn't have food, and sometimes they would drink water. And, um, uh, so it suggests that there's something deeply non-human, and that is to say, non-human. Uh, about his experience in Auschwitz, right? So he says, and, and at the end of that chapter, he says, um, um, I'm really sorry you don't have the text, but, right? He says, um, right, he, he's so, uh, I must explain to him, he says, I must explain him, that is to the people, about the Middle Ages, about the so human and so necessary and yet unexpected anachronism Oh, the anachronism is, uh, is at the end of that canto, uh, the, the implication Dante gives is that God kills Ulysses. But obviously Ulysses didn't have a God. So that's the anachronism uh, that he's talking about. And what Dante really means is that the poet, I'm the poet, I get to stick Ulysses in hell. Um, so, but still more, something gigantic that I myself have only just seen in a flash of intuition. Perhaps the reason for our fate, for our being here today. And that is that insight, that insight of the whole, that somehow the Nazis are writing this whole camp, right? And as I said before, that he is Ulysses, right? He's trapped. Um, and then, the, then, the, then the, uh, the, the, the chapter ends precisely the way the canto ends. And so it's a direct quote from Dante. And over our heads, the hollow seas closed up, right? In other words, the soup which might have saved us around us. And, you know, the other, well, I, I could go on, but it's hard to talk when, you know, you don't have the text. But I'm hoping that was a little helpful, at least uh, tempted some of you to, even if you don't read all of Dante, you know, read Inferno 26 and, and, read, uh, and read this chapter. You'll understand much more deeply. Why Levy, I think, is considered, I think, to be our greatest uh, Holocaust memoirist. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Sharon. I, we're just about out of time. If there are any questions, does anyone want to put up a hand and ask a question? I don't see. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, it's Malcolm. Go ahead. Just have to unmute. And I think we'll make that Hi. our last question. Okay. So it's interesting, and I'll get to my question last, because uh, uh, that the Lubavitcher Rebbe in today's Parsha quotes a Midrash that said Jacob, when confronted with the prophecy that the children, that his children would be enslaved by the Egyptians, was given, was given the choice of galut or exile for so long or hell i don't know hell gehenna and I, I know they lived at the same point that was there any interaction or was one one uh 
Primo Levi or or the the, the Lubavitcher Rebbe were they did they have influence on each other? That's really my question. Because that it, is, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm done. That is such an interesting question because, of course, they must have because, right? They both had the interest in science, right? I mean, that that is really. I, I don't know the answer to. It. I've never encountered anything that put them together, but but it's. I'm going to look into it. That's very interesting. That's really interesting. Is um, it, if I send you my email and then when you find an answer, you you could send it back to me. Absolutely. If I find that there is an answer, otherwise it 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 it, it didn't happen. But 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 the one thing I know, Levy Levy really was secular in in European terms. He, um, the reason he came to know the Bible, and he knew the Bible very well because there was nothing that this man did not know very well, is because uh, when, the, when it was fascist Italy, but before sort of the Nazis had come in, um, he, uh, he, he studied the Bible and he used to have meetings with everybody to try to show them, hey, Judaism's pretty good. So he, he, he actually became quite knowledgeable in Bible. But, but I, I, don't know, I don't know about this... Uh, I have to look it up. It's a that is so interesting to me. I'll, I'll look it up. Right. You know, some of our our some of our heretics, some of our great heretics, were were very versed in the, in the Bible. In fact, they were versed right. <laughs> more. And then, right. No, that's true. Well, once again, Sharon, we thank you on behalf of Temple Beth Shalom for a most incredible presentation. I know everyone enjoyed it and found it very illuminating.